I think if my memory serves me, Harley Davidson made enough spare parts to build another 20,000 bikes. I think. Right, carb's leaking, so while it's apart, apart we might as well strip it. Bushes are quite worn in that. Sure, oh, don't feel too bad. I think I've got some bushes somewhere. I do like doing stuff up tight, don't I? Rust in there, me thinks. Right, so she's got a steel float in her, which is better than the cork. Still got his bang in it. bleed holes up so that needs a proper clean out there really a lot else can go wrong with that we've just got to get that side cover off make sure the holes in there aren't blocked unbelievable Jet is on idle side. All these little bungs are just basically bungs. You can take them out and then clear all the air passages out. If you're going to take one of these apart, they're so simple, you might as well do the whole lot. Yeah. all of that and we can give that a wash down and a blow through make sure the holes are clear so let's see what's going on in here That needle is what's known in the trade as knackered. Might need a jet kit, I'll have to look and see what bits we've got. But you see that ridge around there? That's never ever going to seal. 
so the new needles are probably Viton tipped but that's not ever going to seal hence why it's just pouring fuel out the carb that's your main inlet as the float comes up it pushes that down into that hole as you rotate it it's leaking so basically you need some carburetor parts you see that ridge round there in the shiny bit that should be a nice smooth taper yeah and when it sits in inside that hole that bit yeah. all right as that goes in there as the float comes up that should just it should be probably sitting about there so it's all basically it's worn out so that's never ever going to seal that's what, and that's what primarily is causing the, the yeah because your float <coughs> comes up pushes down on that and that should seal that but with a tip like that on it it's, it's not ever going to work yeah okay john robert he says i'm looking at buying a wla in europe and the problem i'm having is not uh, not know what cheap reproduction is versus a good engine what advice can you give when looking at them to buy? Maybe a video on what a new buyer could be looking for. I mean, they do make reproduction frames now. Um, if you look in the headstock, there's a casting number. I can't remember it off the top of my head. Um, the rear, where the rear axle goes through, there's casting numbers there. Yeah. But whether the repro frames have those casting numbers, I don't know. I wouldn't be too bothered about buying one without an engine number on it so if you look remember you can look underneath the casings yeah. and find the other numbers yeah. um, and the chances of finding one that have got everything original on it are very few and far between you know do you get a lot of cheap reproduction stuff on in engines internally yes but your casings you can't buy i don't think okay yeah anything internal is going to be repro now i mean you don't be wrong then harley made so many spares like there'll be genuine Harley pistons we're putting into Dean's engine, but the barrels, will be, they're made in India. Yeah. Because um, they don't make them anymore. Um, but small parts, they, I think, I think if my memory serves me, Harley Davidson made enough spare parts to build another 20,000 bikes. I think. Um, so, if you want to get really anal and you buy everything new old stock, you can, but there's so many repro parts out there you know the nut and the washer situation if you want a genuine new old stock the washer's going to be three euros the nut's going to be a four euros yeah if you want a repro part which intrinsically looks exactly the same it's 50 cents it's penny, isn't it? but the the bolts are a different situation because they've got 1035 cp written on them so if you want it original, you, you buy the ones with 1035 CP on them. And that's really the only difference, isn't it? You could have that stamp mark on it. It's a raised cast mark, yeah. But yeah, that's that's the only difference really on the on the bolts. And there's a company called War Department, and they they only stock original parts. But your your restoration bill is going to double easily. At least, yeah. at least double if you try and do it all with genuine parts. I guess it's the guys really asking when he goes to buy a bike. Problem he's having is not knowing what's what pre cheap reproduction versus a good engine. And well, I don't think you're yeah. the there isn't road. really any markings on the barrels to tell you if they're repro or not. Um, uh, there's so many spares out of it, I wouldn't fret about the engine as long as it's got, I wouldn't worry about the 42 WLA number or the 43 WLC number. You see a lot of them with no engine numbers because they were changed in the field. Yeah. It's the two numbers underneath on the bottom of the engine casing. Yeah. You want those to match both sides and you don't want it any later than 45 if you want a wartime bike. Because don't forget they built those engines until 1973 for survey cars. Yeah. Um, but they're, they're G labelled engines. If, if the engine hasn't got matching numbers on it, mm -hmm. what's, the, what's the bad thing about that? nothing bad about it they're, they're all they would have been cast as a pair or stamped up as a pair when so it was value purposes. when it was originally built yeah you can say matching casing numbers yeah, yeah. that gives it greater value to, have to a certain point yeah yeah but as far as operational side won't make any difference 
Michael Little, he says, I have a WLA and have found that when I turn the fuel tap and lift it for reserve, it falls back down again. How do I remove the tap to see if something's come adrift on it? Secondly, the engine number does not have to have WLA in it, but quite obviously is a WLA motor. Should I try to contact the restorer if I can find them to see what, what that's about? Or is it normal for the engine to be renumbered with a full resto? Depends where it's done. If it's done in Europe, I think you have to have an engine number stamped in it and you have to have a frame number stamped in it if it's restored in Europe. Really? Yeah, in certain countries in Europe, yeah, because you see a lot of them. I think Malcolm's got one on his stamped in it. Michael's got that plate glued to the frame. Yeah. Um, they won't register them unless they've got an, a number on them. That's the point over there. Um, oh, you seem to remember the Dutch one. Yeah. There was. Um, yeah, that was that had a number on the oh. on the side, and he wanted it left. So I asked yeah. him if he wanted it taken out, but he. Was, do you remember him saying, "No, you need it for registration yeah, over registration here." Registration and almost insurance. As yeah, well. something like that. Yeah, you, you get a card over there with it all on, don't you? Um, as for the engine, again, underneath the casings. Yeah. Have a look underneath the casings, and that'll tell you exactly when it was made. Okay. So it will say forty-two onwards because the castings are slightly different on a 4041 but only very slightly um, be the number stamped at the front as you look front piston crankcase but about that angle underneath both casings will have 44 or 43 or 42 and then a dash and then it's the number of engine that came off the production line after that on on that year cool and this fuel tap this is the all right take the top off um, and there should be a spring and a leather washer in the top. Yeah. So you take your knob off, undo the bit around the tank, pull that up, and there should be a little spring and a leather washer that's probably dried out. That's all it is. You pick it out, put the new leather washer in, put the spring on, do the top up, and it just tightens up. Is there a reverse gear on these bikes? Can get reverse in them, yeah. It's exactly the same gearbox um, as in that. They only, I don't know if they put them on sidecars. Um, normally the bigger Harleys have the sidecars, but certainly the survey car, the three-wheel survey car. Yeah, it's just you put another gear in. There's another cog goes in on the outer face of the gearbox when you're putting the cover on. And then when you set up the gear change cam, it's got it's marked up one or R one two three. So all it is is when you index the cam to your adjuster yeah you've got your arm that the gear rod changes yeah mm -hmm. so as you change gear it pulls that arm backwards and forwards yeah. there's a mark on that and you either set it up for a free speed box or you set it up with the letter r you click it in there and then providing you've got the other cog in it but yes you, you can put reverse on them yeah it's just an extra mm -hmm. cog and setting up your barrel different you very often though do you i've only ever done them on survey cars uh, Sam Roberts says, so I'm curious what Ash thinks about 16 or 18 inch wheels. Mine has 16 inch, but I'm considering a more classic appearance with 18 inch. Any preference or thoughts on... The WLA's actual military ones didn't have 16 inch wheels. Okay. No, it was only when they swapped back to civilian use. Maybe some of the very early ones had 16 inch wheels, um, but most, 99.9% .9 of the militaries had 18 inch wheels. Any preference personally? Um, I, some people say the balloon tyres on the 16s make them a bit bouncier to ride, you know, a bit more, a bit softer, but I don't think it makes a lot of difference, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, Robin Buey says, it looks like the rear chain is hitting the gearbox housing on the uh, rear chain adjustment. Have you got any suggestions what could be causing this? Well, firstly, was it, was it hitting the gearbox housing on that? Well, I don't know if he means our video or his bike. Um, okay, assume it's your, this, uh, the video that we did, the, the bike here. No, the only thing that will do it is if the wheel's so far out of alignment or if the front sprocket is actually loose. Okay. Because um, it's wobbling around. On the bike here, it's not hitting the housing. No. But what could cause it? The front cog can come loose. It's fitted just with a big nut, a lock washer and two wood rough keys. If that comes loose, then it, it will do this. They won't fall off because yeah. the nut physically can't come off because it hits the outside of the casing. Yeah. But um, that's the most common thing. Or the chain is so worn. 
or the back wheel's so far out of alignment. Duco, and he was asking about the WLA again, what paint did you use on the cylinders and cylinder heads? The cylinders come, the repro ones, come with the paint already on them, you don't have to touch them. Yeah. And I use, it's a Simon Eyes um, gloss black engine aerosol for the cylinder heads. Okay. It's very good. Okay, this guy is asking about the 1936 Ford Flathead V8, Wayne Berry. <coughs> I'm interested, they're particularly interested in the replacement of the poured main bearings as I have one of those engines which is finished if I can get the main bearings report. I take it that the bearings were standard internal diameter princess main shells sliced into two halves with journals ground to suit. The part number would be good if you have one. Uh, noting the retainer map notches, was the black line board to suit the oversized diameter of the princess shells? It's not just as simple as the shells because formals engineering, formals race and classic or vintage and classic, vintage and race, vintage and race I think. Um, down in Downton they are, Wiltshire I think it is, just fine, sort of <laughs> north of Hampshire, uh, Southampton. But they're the guys who did it, very, very, very knowledgeable. Um, it works out cheaper than pouring the white metal bearings, that's why we did it. But it's not just as simple as changing the shells, well, they were definitely princess shells, cut in half. You have to, he made the end thrust bearings which were made out of bronze or phosphor bronze or brass and actually screwed into the caps and everything but made a lovely lovely job of it i, I would suggest talking to charlie at formals he's, he's very very knowledgeable uh, kiss brewster and this is again about wla i have to strip mine down in a month or so where did you pick up your parts from i would have mine some clutch parts from 45 Flathead Service in the Netherlands, but he never got back to me. So I got what I wanted from Beans Paint and Parts in Royston, which had a great service. So where would you get your WLA parts from? Normally use Jan, Willem, Boone. Um, there's, like we were just discussing earlier, there's a minimum order now, but if you're doing a complete engine rebuild, you'll be way over the minimum order. So Anywhere else apart from... Uh, there's 45 parts, Larry Elias his name is, but he seems to have gone off the radar a little bit. Okay. Um, but Yanville and Boone, they're pretty on the ball, but there is a minimum charge. Uh, Steve Burke, about WLA. I notice Ash keeps his manual well protected. <laughs> uh, can you please tell me which manual he uses in this video? Right, well, there's only three. You've got your parts book, which, if you look up this number, G523, that's your parts book. Yep. That lists every nut, bolt, washer. So if you want to get it totally original, you can. And basically, these two work in conjunction with each other. So you've got the TM9 1879 and your TM9 879. They work within, you know, you bandy between the two of them and you'll find out exactly what you want to find out. Where do you get those from? Again, any, any of the part suppliers, Janville and Bone sells them all. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Mike Little, uh, this is about WLA. Similar question to an earlier one. The fuel tap on my WLA won't stay up for a reserve. Yeah. Can you give me any clues why? Again, it's just a little spring. Let's see if we can find the parts. A little spring and a washer in there, and it, if, if it's all worn, it just doesn't work. So all it is, the little spring pushes the compresses the washer slightly which goes around the rod and that's just what holds it it might be a rubber in there I can't remember let's have a look at the parts but it's all doable very easily and doable right there you go look okay so that's your rod that goes up and down then that's your top knob that you twist and pull up and down on so take that screw off the top take that off undo that with a pair of grips then you've got a spring a flat washer and then a ceiling washer so that spring when that's done up tight the washer can only go in so far into the top of the tank the ceiling washer yeah yeah then that flat washer goes on then the spring then you do that up and as it compresses it just puts some pressure on that ceiling washer and tightens up around the shaft that's it so again if you go on to Yanville and Boone's type in this number as a search number and it'll come straight up with it perfect next week on the workshop right that's your standard wiring loom for a normal civilian wl and that is your wiring loom 
for a military WL. As you can see, there's a lot more wires. But if you follow the diagram, it's, it's pretty easy, you know? So, here we go.